Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful spring afternoon. This is why we all live in Atlanta, right? It's gorgeous. And uh, I just had a, was telling friends, I just had my family here for the holiday weekend, and they just texted me on their way home with the weather they were going into where it's snowy, drizzly, and 34 degrees. So they were very excited about the warm weekend that they had in Atlanta. So we're here today uh, to celebrate the Hugh P. Davis Lecture. And this is always a special event for the school, but this year it feels a bit more celebratory. For starters, we're in person. Yay. <laughs> We have gone through so many rough waters with COVID-19 and to be here together today is very refreshing. And it's encouraging to see the world recovering and we can again dip into our entire educational toolkit like in-person lectures. Second, it's a very special day because we get to learn more about the work of our esteemed lecturer, Dr. Sandy Dunbar. She is such an iconic person, not just for the School of Nursing, but for Emory. And I remember 13 years ago when I decided to come to Emory, Sandy was being hotly recruited by other places. And I, she may remember the call where I said, if you leave, I'm not coming. <laughs> Remember that, Sandy? So it's, it's so, I'm so grateful to call her a colleague and a friend from now multiple decades. She's a trusted leader and uh, aide in the school, has been a part of my leadership team. And without Sandy, our school definitely would not be what it is today. So we're very fortunate today to have others here from the university recognizing uh, Sandy's legacy and why she was selected by her peers to give this lecture today. So we have with us uh, John Lewin, the Senior VP of the Health Sciences Center. John, thank you for being here. And Ravi Bellaconda, who is the Provost of uh, Emory University. Thank you, Ravi, for being here. And a special guest, President Benvez, is here to speak with us today. He's going to tell you a little bit more about Sandy, because if I had to tell, tell you about much more about Sandy, I'd be crying. So, but I can tell you about the Davis family. So uh, the Davis Lecture was established to honor the memory of Dr. Hugh P. Davis, who was an ear, nose, and throat specialists. So what does that have to do with nursing? Well, as so often the case, Dr. Davis's wife was a nurse. <laughs> Her name was Alice Kidd Davis, and she helped shape his career and his interest. And one of their shared interest was the profession of nursing. And they both saw nursing as a critical factor in the equation of human health. And the Davis family has been a lot to the school. Uh, many years they, they come to this lecture, but they're also avid fans of Disney World. And so when the, we always compete with Disney World in these cool spring weeks in, in the South. So they can't be with us today, but uh, please join me in thanking the family for their continued support. So Dr. Benvez, his leadership through the pandemic, I mean, imagine becoming the president right when a pandemic hits. So uh, quite amazing. Everyone saw his leadership right away. And, but he, we knew when he was recruited to come to Emory, what a distinguished uh, researcher and educator he was and an experienced executive leader. We're seeing it now um, month by month with the accomplishments of the university. And uh, he, his philosophy of leadership and what Emory stand for is just a perfect fit. And uh, he's so excited about helping us create preserve, teach, 
and apply knowledge in the service of humanity. So please join me in welcoming President Bendez. Well, first of all, thank you, Dean McCauley, for that uh, wonderful introduction, and especially thank you for your leadership, the Nell Hudson Woodruff School of Nursing. Give, give the Dean a big round of applause. Well, I'm very honored to be here today to welcome you to the Hugh P. Davis Lecture to be presented by Dr. Sandra Dunbar. And I'm gonna call you Sandra. I'll be a little, little bit more uh, formal. <laughs> who is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Cardiovascular Nursing, of course, here at Emory University. During her 32 year career at Emory, Dr. Dunbar has, is both an internationally recognized scholar and a remarkable academic leader, known for bringing excellence and impact to everything that she works on. Among her many accomplishments, Dr. Dunbar's research into the psychosocial, psychosocial aspects of managing heart disease has significantly improved cardiovascular health care for patients here and around the world. Given that cardiovascular disease remains a leading cause of death worldwide, her research contributions are especially important, improving outcomes for patients and their families and promoting interventions that reduce cardiovascular risk and support quality of life. Her research has shined a much needed light on health inequities in cardiac care, with a special attention to minority populations as well as women, two groups that have historically been overlooked in cardiovascular clinical trials. Her scholarship has been influential, interdisciplinary, and collaborative, touching countless individuals through life-changing discoveries and exemplifying Emory's mission to serve humanity. As a teacher and a mentor, she has shaped the next generation of caregivers, serving as an inspirational force in the lives of nursing students, postdoctoral trainees, and early career faculty across many disciplines. But in addition to her outstanding scholarship and teaching, Dr. Dunbar has played an inf influential role as a leader in nursing education administration. During her long tenure as Senior Associate Dean of Academic Advancement at the School of Nursing, she has bolstered academic hires, doubling the number of nursing school faculty members, and expanding and improving faculty diversity. She's played a key role in supporting the success of Emory School of Nursing, which has experienced record growth in, uh, in research and growth in the number of students in the past three years, and is now ranked among the best in the nation for bachelors, graduate, and doctoral programs. Now we know this is a time when the demand for skilled nursing care has never been higher. In fact, it, is, it has soared. Dr. Dunbar has consistently strengthened the profession, upholding its highest standards and supporting Emory as a top research university that attracts world-class faculty talent. As Dean McCauley has observed, the Nell Hodson School of Nursing would not be what it is today if it were not for Dr. Dunbar. So as president of Emory University, I wanna recognize her for extraordinary dedication, leadership, passion for helping those around her to flourish and thrive. So thank you all for being at today's Davis Lecture, which will focus on optimizing cardiovascular health outcomes in a lecture to be presented by Dr. Sandra Dunbar. So thank you everyone for being here today. And while we're getting set up, let me just uh, say thank you again to um, Dr. Uh, McCauley for your kind words, to President Fenvis for that lovely introduction, to um, Provost Bellacomba for being here, um, Executive Vice President John Lewin. I know that everyone has many things to do today and this afternoon. So thank you so much for sharing this time. And uh, my good colleagues from the School of Medicine, Dr. Kayumi is here and, um, and others. So such an exciting time for me, and I'm truly honored and humbled to be uh, selected as the Davis Lecturer. I really appreciate the school honoring one of its own. I also um, would like to say that um, thank you to the Davis family, and also would like to thank the students who, come, who came today, because to me, you are about to embark on one of the most exciting journeys of your lifetime and exciting careers. 
And I did, I did entitle this um, a journey through a program of research pathways, intersections, byways, and connections, because that really is what a program of research is about. And you intersect with other disciplines, other areas of science, brilliant colleagues, um, and a wonderful group of trainees and mentees. Um, and sometimes on your journey, you have a map and you know where you're going. And sometimes you are going around a corner and you don't know what's going to be around there. And no matter how hard um, or how well you plan your itinerary, there are roadblocks and constant times of uh, problem solving for, for this journey. So um, I love this quote by the New York Times writer, Melissa Kitch, who said, we travel not just to escape, but to find novelty so evidence, new heights, and new sensations. And sometimes that's what I think about a program of research. So like any journey you start on, you have a destination, right? And so my uh, dream of a destination was to make a difference in the outcomes of cardiovascular patients. And as a critical care nurse, I, was, um, I loved complexity and I was uh, always intrigued by working with persons who had complex life-threatening cardiovascular conditions. Um, as a medical technology major who converted to nursing to get away from petri dishes and organic <laughs> chemistry, I realized I had a great talent, and that was for passing out. So I would pass out at the first injection, first lumbar puncture I witnessed, oh, you name it, and um, I uh, had a, a difficult time as a BSN student. My, I had an instructor tell me, I don't think you're cut out for nursing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I also loved my research class, which many students did not at the time. I guess it was that science background, but I loved, uh, I loved research and I loved thinking about evidence and um, thinking about creating science and evidence in nursing. Like any good journey, um, I had a roadmap with a great mentor, Dr. Marguerite Kinney, who put me um, on the road and she actually made it look appealing. So early in my work, uh, I um, was intrigued by persons who were at risk for uh, ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death. And um, I started working with this patient population who were recipients of implantable cardioverter defibrillators who, um, were experiencing uh, this implantable device. And it was early in the development of this device. Actually, they just, it's the 40th anniversary of ICDs, um, which is hard to believe. Um, but we were hearing a lot of anxiety from patients about what it was gonna be like to live with an IDD, what well, ICD, what it was gonna be like to be shocked for a lethal arrhythmia. And we set about to describe what patients and families were experiencing early in the phase of this development of this device. Um, and I wanna just say that we learned a lot through a series of focus groups with patients and family members um, using a stress and coping framework to understand what, it, what were their needs and how were they coping and what they perceived as ways to help. And uh, this, uh, this first R01, this was the first R01 for me um, after some preliminary work with from the American Heart Association grant. And it was actually the first R01 in the School of Nursing at the time. So um, we also learned a lot about what patients were experiencing, you know, the patient education at the time was not very sophisticated. And in fact, it, um, it said, being shocked like an ICD felt like being kicked in the chest by a mule or touching an electric fence. And so um, patients did not find that too appealing. <laughs> and um, we also heard about their worries about being shocked multiple times in one setting. And, um, you know, we presented this data at the American Heart Association and uh, other heart rhythm society groups. And the device industry did not like hearing these presentations. Um, and they actually, we gained the reputation as being the multi-shock lady. So, um, you know, it was not, it was pretty stressful at the time. So um, at one cardiac grand rounds here at Emory, one of our colleagues stood up and he said, 
well, this is all well and good. It's, uh, you know, but we have a lot of stress in our own work. I get stressed in the Atlanta traffic. So um, is this important? And I was kind of taken back because I thought as a nurse, a uh, low quality of life and um, worry and distress and depression was important. And, but he was asking a very important so what question and it would needed to be asked and uh, we needed to answer it. And so in this next study, uh, I mean, we had um, longitudinal data. And so what we were able to do is step back and look at the impact of psychosocial distress. And what you see in this uh, slide is the uh, total mood distress scores, um, which is a combination of anxiety, depression, uh, fear, and total mood disturbance um, measured by our instruments. And over time, those who were shocked by the yellow line had higher scores than those who did not. And so we were able to report on this cyclical nature of psychosocial and ICD shocks and stress. And the, um, the shocks were adjudicated by our physician team based on the device interrogation so they could remove inappropriate shocks. And so it um, added a lot of validity to that study and we were able to report that out. We replicated this in another study called the PRIDE trial, which Dr. Anhil Leon asked us to um, add a quality of life component to that trial. And we found the same types of results. And um, we concluded that by not addressing psychosocial distress in this pa patient population, we were not optimizing this life-saving technology. So now, we had even more dark suits showing up at our presentations. <laughs> um, the psychosocial intervention for ICD patients, we called this the PEACE trial, was a three group um, randomized trial, uh, 240 first ICD recipients. And we measured, um, we randomized them to usual care or a symptom management training intervention or a cognitive behavioral intervention. And it was delivered by either group or telephone. And um, we measured things over time. We had a measurement of outcomes as well as process variables, as you can see. And throughout this talk, I'm not gonna go into depth about these instruments, but I'm happy to answer questions at a later time if that's of interest. Um, they were all standard, uh, well-validated instruments. We also measured health resource use in that study. And so what you see in this one is a um, is at 12 months, we have depression scores were um, reduced and they were 31% in the usual care gr group compared with 15% in our psychoeducation intervention participants. We also found that at baseline, 20% of our population had anxiety scores uh, greater than 40, which is a marker of clinically relevant anxiety. Um, by three months, we had 34% in usual care and 23% in our intervention. We had better uh, illness appraisal with lower threat appraisal and higher quality of life. And interesting, we found lower health-related health resource use in terms of calls um, and time spent on the phone or, or calls to providers for shocks and also disability or sick days, so lower. So we concluded that had some important outcomes in terms of health resource use. And, you know, we want our research to have an impact. We don't want it to just sit on the shelves of our cyber library today. And um, what this, this set of studies led to included a set of guidelines um, and it was um, incorporation of education and psychological interventions and in scientific statements. Also into uh, patient education materials, which included information about patient teaching and counseling and also end of life um, care for people who were very worried about what it would be like at end of life with um, an ICD. And then patient support groups became a standard of care in many institutions. 
So when you take a journey, you have an opportunity to stop at a lovely vista and reflect on what you're seeing and learning. And what we learned in this set of studies is that perceptions and psychosocial health of patients and families do matter in this population. And we learned also because we had measured process and outcome measures, why our psychosocial interventions worked. And that helped also with subsequent studies. We underscored that connection of mental and physical health. Um, we learned a lot about the importance of pilot work, how critical our pilot studies were because they were very short term and we realized we needed longer term interventions in this group. Um, we also um, had great reaffirmation of the research environment here at Emory for interdisciplinary collaboration and openness to the ideas of others and other disciplines. And um, we'll just really always be appreciative to Dr. Langberg, Paul Walter, um, and Angel Leon for opening the EP labs and allowing us to recruit patients. When we hear about many nurse uh, scientists across the country who have difficulty with access to patients, and we've never had that issue. We have learned what having a great study team of staff means. They are the key to the success of a study and they are worth their weight in gold. Um, they are the ones doing the real work uh, out in the uh, clinical setting, recruiting, collecting data, following these participants. And um, I say to any students here, this is another fabulous research um, career opportunity for, for nurses. A, a research nurse coordinator cannot be, um, the value cannot be overestimated and we never pay them enough. <laughs> uh, the advantage of nursing involvement at the time of device involvement was really important, the time of device development, because that fed into back into um, things like algorithms for less, um, less sensitive shocking and or I guess more sensitive shocking for appropriate rhythms and things like that, as well as, um, we know that nurses are also developing their own devices. I had a wonderful opportunity to work with on another device development um, based on the connection with Dr. Kathy Wood, a, a faculty member who's well known to us. She uh, was not a, at an Emory at the time and we worked on the development of a atrial defibrillator, which still is um, under uh, investigation and greater use in Europe than it is today. So that was exciting. And um, so, uh, you know, as ICD use increased, um, we became, in, it became more um, appropriate for patients with heart failure and low ejection fraction. And as one of two nurses invited to be on this guideline writing group for care of patients with heart failure, I learned more and more about the difficulties that heart failure, heart failure patients had with self-management, um, difficulty with adherence. They were, are a high burden to the system and society because of greater use of health services for preventable problems, as well as very high readmission rates. And so um, we embarked on a side road, uh, I thought at the time, to um, address the self-care needs of persons with heart failure. And we know that approximately 50% of heart failure patients have difficulty with medication adherence and close to 60% uh, have difficulty with dietary guidelines. They're also asked to do a lot of other things, uh, managing their symptoms, monitoring their symptoms, um, daily weights, communicating with a provider, physical activity when they don't feel well, um, and other um, re other behavior changes like reducing alcohol and smoking. And we also know that all of this takes place in a family context. So we wanted to learn more about um, self-management in a family context. And so we developed this family um, conceptual framework, family-focused conceptual framework to think about um, what interventions might be helpful for this population. And we developed this framework using um, the literature that showed what types of factors influenced a self-management behavior, focusing 
specifically on dietary sodium as the exemplar here. So we see that there are precursors, there's individual characteristics, clinical characteristics, that people have to have the prerequisite knowledge and skills and behavioral characteristics such as depression and self-efficacy certainly influence this ability to perform this behavior and then adequate um, performance of the behavior. And I say adequate based on a particular standard we're trying to reach with dietary sodium results in certain outcomes like better adherence scores, better physical and mental health, and then distal outcomes of less better self-care should result in uh, less hospital readmissions. And then all of this takes place in a family context and the family structure, the way it problem solves, the way it communicates, the way it adapts, influence the patient's ability to do this particular behavior. And so those, that was our conceptual framework. Um, and we then embedded social determination theory within this framework. And this is a theory that has been studied by many researchers around the world, and it populates that it postulates that a desired behavior is more likely in an environment characterized by empathy and support versus one characterized by control or coercion by others. And this has been studied in many different aspects, including um, with children in education settings, with adults trying to make behavior change, for multiple things, including healthcare. We worked with the, um, the developers of this theory, Rich Ryan, who helped us adapt it to um, the idea of how do we promote an autonomy supportive environment in a family. And they had been working with autonomy support with healthcare providers. How do you help healthcare providers be more empathetic um, to provide more support? less control, less paternalistic approaches. Um, and so uh, we thought about how to do this with families and they were very excited to help us because this was the first use of this theory in this way. So we tested this in um, what we call the INSPIRE study. This was education and support to improve heart failure self-care. And um, we focused on dietary sodium and medication adherence in this study. And we hypothesized that we would have better outcomes when we provided a family partnership intervention over a patient family education intervention. And I'd like to thank Dr. Pat Clark for her excellent input into this study and the protocol and also the um, uh, uh, development of instruments to measure some of our concepts. One of the things that was important in this study, in addition to family, um, patient and family education, and this autonomy supportive family partnership intervention was providing feedback on the behavior change. And you have to think about this, patients get very little feedback on how they're doing with um, something like reducing dietary sodium. I mean, they might get feedback if they're using a pill box and they are looking in and they know that something's been taken or hasn't. But um, with diet changes, it's really, really difficult. So we measured 24 hour urine, uh, which 95% um, of what you ingest in sodium is excreted in uh, the urine. And we gave them this feedback of their goal was you know, to reach 2000 milligrams a day. Here's this person, they're at 45, a little over 4,500 milligrams a day. Um, and that was their first one at four months. And then here's their one at, uh, this is their baseline, I'm sorry. And then the other one was um, the, the four months. So baseline and then four months. And, um, and we also had the research nurse called and spoke with the patients and family members about what their high sodium foods and low sodium foods were. So in this slide, you can see the results of the 24 hour urinary sodium by group, um, which was our measure. And um, this is over time and there's significant um, group and time effects. And this is with adjustment by covariates of gender depression scores, the BDI and ferrosamide equivalents or equivalents related to um, diuretics for each group. And what you see is in this first um, graph, first line, this is usual care. 
And usual care is starting above 40, 44,000 milligrams a day, and they drop maybe about uh, 400 milligrams, but they don't sustain it over time. Usual care, I do want to say, is, um, was excellent. And this was in our Emory and VA system. And um, patient education was very strong. And we did some content analysis and other things to verify that it was sa the same across institutions. Um, so even in, in good usual care, it's difficult to make this change. This, this line is the patient family education group where patient and family were educated together. They had um, shopping uh, exercises, lots of um, recipes, lots of other things to help them, other supports. And they did make a slight change and then it stayed um, consistent over time. And then what we see in the family partnership intervention is a um, earlier decline, and then it uh, maintains over time. So we asked the question, is this clinically meaningful? And this slide shows um, that how, what percent of each group was able to receive, to uh, achieve a rate of ingesting 2,500 milligrams a day or less. So we were trying to get them between two and three, um, closer to two, but it's really hard. <laughs> and so we, we landed on 2,500 milligrams a day for this analysis. And you can see at baseline, there's no difference. By four months, we're starting to see a little difference in trend, um, not statistically significant. And then by eight months, we see that both um, the patient and family education and the family partnership achieve a good result. Now this has a lot of stuff in it. So if you'll just stay with me a minute, I'll give you the highlights. And what you see is the graph by three different groups, usual care, the PFE and the FPI. And then it's broken down by family functioning. So the solid line is the poor family function across each group. And then the dotted line is the good family function based on a family function measure. And what we see is in the usual care group, with poor family function, they don't make a, a change and then they of course don't maintain it. But if they have good family function, they initially make a change, but they don't retain it or don't sustain it. In the patient and family education group, the one that got really in-depth patient and family education together, we see in poor family function a decline, but it, they don't maintain. And then in the um, good family function, we see a decline and then they maintain. And we don't wanna see additional, we weren't looking for additional decline between four and eight months. We really just wanted to see uh, maintenance. Then in the family partnership group, this is the interesting one to me, is that we have poor family function, are able to make the change and then they are able to maintain it. Um, and then in good, uh, good family function, we see that line similar to what you just saw. So what this tells me is that family function is a really important variable in our um, behavior change efforts that we sometimes don't pay a lot of attention to, and that it is an important social determinant determinant of health. It's part of the environment. And while we don't um, never set out to change the whole family function, the uh, whole way the family functioned in terms of communication, um, adaptability, problem solving, we were able to do that in um, and around a specific behavior change with that intervention. So it, it tells you where you want to put your effort um, because it does take a lot of effort to do that intervention. And this intervention um, has been adapted for other um, populations. And here's an example with factors associated with depressive symptoms of care partners of stroke survivors. And they're uh, testing an autonomy support intervention in uh, stroke survivors undergoing a complex upper limb uh, rehabilitation program. Dr. Sarah Blanton from PT is here today and Pat Clark. So what did we learn in this set of studies? Um, clearly that autonomy support was important for behavior change that feedback was critical. Patients had uh, relatively uh, very little feedback and most many of us are wearing something to give us feedback on activity levels, right? So we want feedback. Um, appreciation, patients and families appreciated not just knowing what they needed to do, but why and how. 
and families felt liberated as motivators because they weren't um, having to monitor the patient. They were um, sharing motivational messages um, and I mentioned family function already as being really critical. And we also learned that patients with certain comorbidities struggled even more, those with heart failure and diabetes. And um, this reaffirmed also the great research environment we have here for collab interdisciplinary collaboration. As um, Dr. Kayumi, Dr. Smith, um, Dr. Javed Butler, who's no longer here, opened the heart failure clinics uh, openly for us. So we also learned that heart failure is like a wolf. It never travels alone and that comorbidities are really critical. Um, I mentioned the struggles of our population with diabetes. And this uh, slide says 20 to 40% have type 2 diabetes, but we learned that uh, in, that, um, in our population, 40% had diabetes. And uh, they were the most ones that were most likely to be readmitted and had um, the worst outcomes. So we embarked on this series of studies, two studies um, to address uh, ways to improve outcomes in person, persons with heart failure and diabetes. And um, this was funded by an R21 and then an R01 where we, um, in this initial work, held patient and family uh, focus groups again to learn about what were their challenges in um, self-managing with heart failure and diabetes? Where did it conflict? Where did it, um, you know, where was it synergized in terms of their self-care? We also did focus groups with stakeholders, clinicians, pharmacists, providers, dietitians, uh, to learn what their experiences were. And uh, we had community advisory board and a clinical advisory board. And certainly this was prior to um, any PCORI work, um, and also, but it has, it has some elements of that, of thinking of patients and families as stakeholders. So we were able to share that, uh, to develop an intervention, share it back with our advisors, and um, we refined that intervention and then tested it. So um, we were able to show an improvement in symptoms, quality of life, as well as diabetes, and heart failure self-care. Um, but I just wanted to share this information with you from the study, which shows the physical activity results. And this is based on a standard test that we do with heart failure patients in which we ask them to walk six minutes and then we measure the um, feet that they walked. And you can see at usual care, there's not much difference between, um, at baseline, there's not much difference between usual care and our integrated intervention randomized group. And then at six months, we see um, that the intervention group is able to walk um, uh, approximately 178 feet, uh, mean 178 feet further. And so um, we were pleased at that because it is very difficult to get both patients with diabetes and heart failure to um, do a walking program. And thanks to Dr. Becky Gary for her great um, protocol for that. And then you can see that we also looked at this data um, by a, a gold standard of frailty of 984 feet at usual at baseline, there's not a difference. And then at again, at um, six months, we see that our heart failure, diabetes, self-care and integrated intervention group is, um, has more percentage that are in this uh, category. So we conferred, we said that conferred some positive effects. Well, interestingly, the um, administrators want to know, why should we support costs that are associated with such a complex integrated intervention? Um, and so we have to answer again that so what question. Did this make a difference beyond improving quality of life and physical function? And in this study, uh, we did not have a long enough time to say anything about mortality, but we were able to do an extensive cost um, analysis and we collected ex extensive cost data on health resource use, thanks to Dr. Riley for her um, expert protocol here. Um, and we found that um, we, we used um, 
hospitalizations, emergency department visits, um, and um, office visits. And we found that tying the health, the costs to the Medicare reimbursement rates um, and doing a cost effectiveness analysis resulted in dominance of the intervention over usual care in two ways. We did not see a difference by group in the percent that got actually got readmitted. So you would love to see that if you had a reduced readmission rate. But what we saw is that if people got readmitted, they had shorter lengths of stay so that the intervention group was only um, at a mean of three days versus 7.3 with usual care. So they were um, in better health, less severe um, uh, problems for their readmission. And we also looked then at overall costs and we found that the, uh, with the overall costs, again, the intervention group uh, was dominant over the uh, usual care group in saving costs. So there comes a time in a research career where um, you, have been going and going and going on that treadmill and writing grants and <laughs> leading a PhD program, writing PhD program grants. So it's um, a time when you might need to step back. And this uh, was very beneficial for me to um, have a sabbatical at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the cardiovascular health branch um, with Dr. George Mensa, who was a great mentor had uh, the ability to help me think very broadly about cardiovascular prevention, health disparities, as well as uh, policy. And so um, the joy of this sabbatical and thinking about prevention took me on another journey, and that was to look at family caregivers of persons with heart failure and to think about their cardiovascular health as well. And so this was, um, I had the opportunity to be part of a P01 where we had two parallel R01 studies, intervention studies um, with Dr. Ken Hepburn and Monica Parker leading a family caregiver of Alzheimer's disease um, study and um, our team looking at family caregivers of persons with heart failure. And we had the same uh, design, same um, uh, close to the same intervention with spe specificity for the population and then the same outcome measures. And uh, this was a randomized trial that uh, randomized the caregivers to either a usual care attention control group or a psychoeducational group. So you're seeing that psychoeducation emphasis again um, with combination of education and counseling. And then the, a third group was psychoeducation plus exercise or psych ed plus X. So this um, was an interesting uh, protocol. It was one in which the um, study resulted in reduced caregiver strain, reduced um, caregiver, both mental and physical strain, as well as um, reduced anxiety. There was a trend for depressive symptoms over the six months of the study. We also showed improvement in physical function. Again, um, the family caregivers were based on this intervention, walked more, they had a higher six minute walk, and they also had higher self-reported physical activity and better perceived life changes. But I have to say this study was very difficult and we had a lot of dropout and we had um, a, a lot of attrition and uh, we started, I think, with 160 and we ended with 105. So like others, the reasons people dropped is in escalating uh, caregiver needs of their family member. Um, some deaths, some patients uh, actually, um, we had about 12 of our heart failure patients expire during that time. We also had increased health problems of the family caregivers, and we saw um, other life stresses, many other life stresses, because some of our caregivers are also caring for others in the home or grandchildren. So they're caring for multiple generations. Um, so we, we had not, um, this, to replicate or move this study to the next level will need a lot of work, but I think it can be can certainly be done. We did have a good, some good outcomes 
Um, and this, this study by Dr. Gary is cited quite a bit. Um, we also had a policy outcome with a, um, a scientific policy statement from the American Heart on uh, costs of caregiving. So again, outcomes are important. So as a senior scientist along the way, I have to say that um, I've had the pleasure of working with several large centers in addition to that PO1. And um, Emory has also developed large cohort studies such as the Predictive Health Institute, the Atlanta Cardiomyopathy Consortium. And it's been um, really very uh, rewarding to be a nurse on those, that team those teams and to add variables of interest to uh, nursing questions um, within these large databases. There are four centers that are um, sort of, uh, that I'm gonna tell you about in more depth. So the two on your far uh, right are ones that are currently active. There's a P30 in the School of Nursing studying symptoms, metabolomics in black adults with multimorbidity. Dr. McCauley is now the PI and I'm the pilot core director, and then I'm the pilot core director with Dr. Kayumi for this uh, Center for Diabetes Translation Research. The two on the far left are ones that um, we developed with Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, and the first one is the Meta Health Study. And this was funded by the um, NHLBI. And it was um, Morehouse and Emory are teaming up to el eliminate cardiovascular health, I should say disparity. Um, we don't want to eliminate health equity. <laughs> so uh, the meta health, that was a meta health project. Um, and so that study had four, four major components. And um, I worked with Dr. Priscilla Pimu on a clinical test of a culturally relevant physical activity and uh, diet intervention for African-Americans with metabolic syndrome. And the whole, whole project um, generated a lot of data and papers, and um, there is a large database uh, for that study, which has some biological data as well. Um, and then the next one is the, um, the, the Meta Health. And this was, uh, again, developed with Emory School, School of Medicine and Morehouse School of Medicine. Morehouse Emory Center for Cardiovascular Health Equity or the MECA. This is funded by the American Heart Association. And with um, this framework of, of centers, they ask for, um, okay, the mouse won't go over there. They ask for, um, for, for three projects, a population health study, a clinical study, and a basic science study. And the thoughts behind this center led by Dr. Taylor and Dr. Kayumi were that um, in the past, we have focused a lot on the risk and vulnerability of black populations with poor cardiovascular health outcomes in um, a fairly critical way. And that by um, doing group comparisons, we sometimes don't get to uh, really appreciate the um, strengths of a group or their um, resilience with cardiovascular health in the face of risk and adversity. And so this study focuses on cardiovascular health within the black population. And Dr. Taylor presented a wonderful uh, research roundtable in our school not uh, too long ago um, with all of the outcomes of this uh, center, with uh, all of the outcomes available at the time for this center. And I'll just hit a, highlight a few. Um, because it really focuses on some important um, results. So one, one paper has looked at uh, identifying both resilient and at-risk neighborhoods for cardiovascular disease among Black residents. And these are um, adults who are, have premature cardiovascular events. Um, they're in the age range of 35 to 64 and they used uh, census tract data to identify at-risk and resilient tracts. And there, we found a lot of variation across the Atlanta area. And this happens even when um, the median black income, family income, our household income is taken into account. So we see both resilient and at-risk neighborhoods in the greater Atlanta area. And sometimes they're actually contiguous.
I'm sorry, but this mouse is acting up. Just go there. Um, mm -mm. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, this next exemplar is um, shows that individual psychosocial resilience and neighborhood contacts and cardiovascular health of uh, Black adults, again in the Atlanta area, is um, well um, connected. And what we see is that the greater the psychosocial resilience. Uh, and this is a measure that looks at um, optimism, uh, neighborhood, um, mastery, um, depression scores is related to life simple seven, which is a marker of cardiovascular health. And it's a marker that has um, seven components. And so it uh, was developed by the American Heart Association and is viewed as a marker of uh, cardiovascular health. So we see those two well uh, connected and we see them connected even in at-risk communities. And this study was a one of the clinical studies that looked at the effect of a um, technology-based intervention, so a web-based intervention and health coaches for improving self-management behaviors in Black adults with poor cardiovascular health. And so in this trial, we were able to show that um, that this intervention approach was helpful for people with certain risk factors such as obesity, uh, we had weight loss, improved blood pressure control, improved glycemic control, and that was um, even in at-risk communities. So those were some exciting outcomes and there's much more and this group is also working on how to um, actually develop, uh, that we're developing a data use agreement and way to access this huge uh, set of data. So what do we learn? The VISTA moment here is that building bridges across disciplines, institutions, and communities is essential. Uh, it's, it also results in exponential outcomes of research when institutions and disciplines work together to solve the pressing problems of our times, which cannot be solved, um, rarely can be solved by one discipline. Uh, we learned that there's great interest in making lifestyle changes in this prevention uh, line of work in that we saw greater attrition in our control groups because people wanted help. They didn't want to just um, do something being handed a brochure or told, uh, you know, you need to walk more without all of that, um, that support. Uh, again, we learned social determinants of health are key to addressing cardiovascular risks. And um, we need to also think about incorporating them more into how we understand not only the what relationship, but the why. We learned a lot about team science. Uh, team leadership and motivation is key. So we thank Dr. Kayumi and Dr. Taylor for, um, for that and also keeping us clear on the mission and purpose of these centers and um, the very important role of interdisciplinarity and inclusivity in uh, these types of studies. So what's our future? Um, there's many things that are possible and um, it's very exciting to sit, sit back and say, what do we know? Well, we know that lifestyle matters in cardiovascular health and it can be enhanced through family-focused and technology-based interventions toward improving self-management. And we also know that nursing interventions can be cost-effective and can make a difference um, to our institutions as well as to individuals. We um, see what's possible on the horizon and it's a very bright future, I think, as we work toward precision nursing, as we better tailor uh, family functioning and family focused uh, approaches to symptom and self-management interventions. And there are other ways to do more effective tailoring. We can um, hopefully address more of the family context. Incorporating social determinants of health is uh, essential. Uh, we had many discussions this morning with the doctoral students and postdocs about how they were doing this and what they needed in their training. Um, to look at culture and traditions as we think about behavior change and become more community engaged. This is key to um, 
in INR's strategic direction. And what do we do when families are not able to support the family, um, the family person who needs uh, support in behavior change, as well as the family caregiver? We're working toward the right dose at the right time at the right cost and dissemination and implementation are going to be key. And one of the things that is interesting is when we were talking with a group in the UK about uh, replicating that heart failure diabetes project, the questions they were that they had to answer before their grants could be funded were, if this is effective, what will we do with this information and how will it make a difference? Because um, at the time they were, you know, they're saying nobody does this heart failure, diabetes, integrated self-care. We're going to have to train a new person, a new clinician. Um, and so thinking through how could this happen? How could we implement this? So I thought that was interesting to think about the dissemination implementation piece way um, at the time of, of a study. And we certainly have new tools available to us um, with genetics, genomics, omics, the use of microsensors to give us all kinds of data, and certainly um, AI and deep learning methods. And I hope that we will get to blending the multiple clinical, social, environmental um, variables and for holistic predictions um, as we move forward in thinking about this method. So this is just kind of a fun thing. Um, the librarians uh, do this work for you where they'll do your network analysis. And I'm um, looking at the, um, my publications and my mentees who are very, very productive, what you see in this network analysis. And these nodes are based on the a number of co-authored papers. So you see, this is a great group up here. This is our Morehouse and uh, cardiology group. There's Dr. Kayumi, Dr. Baccarino, Gary Gibbons, Dr. Taylor. Um, and then here's our group uh, in the School of Nursing, Dr. Riley, Higgins, Kimball, Butts, um, Ferrante, <laughs> all the great uh, people who are here today, and Dr. Spikes. So, and then here's some of our other collaborators from the University of Kentucky and Iowa um, and Indiana and uh, Penn. And, um, and then this is that early uh, arrhythmia, arrhythmia work way over there. So, um, and this next slide is uh, the collaborations with mentees and then and their collaborators. So the librarian takes all of your papers and does this very interesting network analysis and then posted it on this map. And I have to say that as a doctoral student or as a BSN student and doctoral student, I never set out to pin dots on a map across the world. <laughs> but I can tell you that it's been one of the most rewarding and um, enriching aspects of, um, of research. And again, we travel not to escape, but to find this novelty new heights and new sensations. So all of this could not be done without, um, and I've just hit the high points, without the uh, excellent participation of all of our study participants. So we thank them and all of the great staff at Emory Healthcare, the VA, Grady, uh, DeKalb. And each of these studies was um, had a CTSA component. And so having uh, the support and resources of the CTSA has been invaluable to this work. Um, the research staff, our biostatisticians, Dr. Higgins and McCarty, uh, consultants, our, all of the co-investigators who are here today um, and some who are not, and we are thankful to our collaborators. So thank you very much to everyone who has influenced my work and um, helped uh, implement this line of science. So thank you for being here today. It's wonderful of you to come and listen to this work and to be a part of this event. And I think I'm supposed to put it here for questions as well as something about scanning this for CE, right? <laughs> so thank you. Hi. In full disclosure, Sandy and I are friends outside of here. Oh my goodness. I can't believe you came. Bless you. <laughs> but I also, um, about the time that Dr. Dunbar was starting her career at Emory, I was an undergraduate university student here. 
um, and found my way 10 years later to becoming a registered nurse and have been a cardiac nurse since the late nineties. Um, and I've worked with heart failure patients, um, and all the things that go with that. So my question is, um, how do we get this research into practice? Because I, you know, um, for so many years, a good, strong nurse with a good, strong team would think of some of these things and realize these, uh, needs of their patients, but of course, staffing, stress, et cetera, mm -hmm. makes it difficult to implement some of these measures. Um, but when you have the research to show the benefits and the improved outcomes, um, I'm just wondering your thoughts mm -hmm. on applying this research into practice. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here. <laughs> um, I uh, think that there's a couple things that we have to do. And in some ways, some of the research is already in practice um, and has been integrated into, for example, the way patients are educated. So if you think about with heart failure and diabetes, what you have is the heart failure nurse comes in and gives this information and the diabetes nurse comes and gives this information and the patient is left to put it together. With great care coordinators, they help put it together. And also we have a great person, Dr. Anita Rich at um, Emory Johns Creek, who is a heart failure diabetes specialist. So she's a great model um, for that. Um, I don't know that we have to go out and train a new person, but in terms of saying, okay, there, we need this type of person. Um, but I think that we can help people gain the knowledge and skills about how those two things interact and how other comorbidities interact with heart failure. We know that arthritis makes a difference um, and that type of thing. And then there's the next level of research that can be done, and that's the dissemination and implementation. So taking it into, how do we take a clinical trial and actually move it into practice? Um, and what are the uh, things that will make it be um, adopted, make it be feasible and cost-effective? So that's another type of study that could take place. Thank you. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk, Dr. Dunbar. So grateful to have you as a mentor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask your thoughts on uh, what direction do you see community engaged research um, going in as far as the um, multiple pathways that you highlighted for us? So I, thank you, Erica, for that question. So I think that um, community engaged research methods have come in there in their own. There are actual methods and things that we should probably be training our students more on, um, as well as thinking about um, how do you gain those skills if you don't have them and you want to adopt them. So certainly something like um, uh, taking uh, some seminars as well as working with others who do this type of work. I know that for example, the CTSA has a community engaged research uh, focus um, and that's a great resource. I also think that um, the work that, of people who are funded through PCORI mechanisms have, um, and we just heard Susan Brasher give a great talk on, um, on those methodologies of how to incorporate perspectives of patient stakeholders and clinical uh, provider stakeholders. I think we did some of that, but we did not do it in such a way that people would say, okay, you followed the exact standard for um, a PCORI type approach. Hi, Sandy. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just want to say um, thank you. You've mentored most of us in this room. And um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and oh, your I slide, might not have mentored you, but I probably hired you. <laughs> and mentored. You know, at some point, we all have spent some time with you. So thank you for that. Um, and you didn't even put the T32s and all the training and all of that. So um, my question to you is, when you first started the talk, you talked about how you were uncovering an area that wasn't so popular with, you know, maybe doctors or other professions. Can you speak to how you navigated those challenges and advice you give to people trying to push forward, maybe in an area that's not as welcoming, mm -hmm. maybe in their research? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thank you for that, Alexis. I think, um, you know, I hope I didn't overemphasize the criticism, but I can say that it, you know, it was tense. And um, I think what was helpful is that there were other nurses also studying these concepts. And so, you know, combine, um, combining 
uh, efforts with them was helpful. Dr. Cindy Doherty was at University of Washington and she's still in this field. Um, and so that was one way uh, connecting with um, uh, publishing the data, getting the data out so that it's data and it's not just me giving a presentation where people might say, oh, you know, they didn't do this or that. So getting you know, your, your data out in a peer reviewed way is another and um also not taking it personally because at first i was like well what do you mean i mean and so it was it was something um, and not taking things like that personally and that was part of my development is learning to work better with other disciplines i think that was really important thank you yeah alita thank you. i particularly love the use of uh uh, journey as a metaphor, <laughs> and you did such an amazing job summarizing and synthesizing a remarkable career, you. Uh, but you know, in a relatively short time. The question that I have for you, and I've seen even in my short time here at the school, I've seen the impact you've had as a leader and an administrator, in addition to being a researcher. So I was wondering if you could talk to how, you know, being on, you know, one journey sort of informed and enhanced the other journey as a leader in the school or vice versa? Yeah, thank you. That's really a great, um, a great question. Um, so I think that what I, helped me most of all was to understand what it was like to be in the trench, <laughs> to be trying to get tenure, to try to write your grants and try to connect and make your studies uh, successful. And so I think that helped um, with creating that research sort of constructive culture, which Linda and I tried so hard to do. And she's the same, you know, she's been in the, the trench of um, doing research and still is very active in that. So I think that's one thing is that it helped inform um, thinking about what do people need? And that is the other piece is like, even today talking with faculty and junior, uh, early career faculty and um, students is saying, you know, what is their perception? What do they need? It's not what I think they need, but what do they think they need? And sometimes it's very different. So that was one. Um, and then thinking of autonomy support is not telling people you have to do this, you must, but saying, okay, I know it's hard. So how are you going to do it? <laughs> how are you going to get there? Um, and if that's not your goal, then you need to think about, you know, this other path. Thank you. I think we're out of time. And um, thank you so much for being here. Brittany, Kathy, if you'd like to come up to speak.